Uh, Bill Simmons, uh, we used to work at the same company, then we changed places, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he works at The Ringer, recently sold to Spotify, who could figure that deal out. He made a bunch of money, but he was already doing well, so I'm not worried about that. He still wears hoodies. I mean, it's like Bill's going to wear tuxedos. He wears hoodies. Uh, Joy Taylor's also joining me. So let me, let me guess, you're not wearing a tux yet. You're still, despite selling to Spotify, you still wore a hoodie right now as we speak. <laughs> I haven't changed, Colin, but you have changed. Yeah. You finally are allowing people to call into your show. <laughs> I just did a tweet about your egomaniacal policy of people have to come into the studio yeah. so you can stare down at them from your desk. <laughs> you lord over them in their opinions yeah. from, from a higher plane. Yeah. So now, now the coronavirus has reduced you to phone calls, and I couldn't be happier <laughs> at least about that. I had Costas on for 30 minutes yesterday, and we'll keep you on as long as you want. So uh, I don't believe it's immoral. I think all crises have to be managed. Uh, you can run. You can hide. Uh, but you have to manage stuff. It's like it's like being a dad. It's like being a parent. It's like being like you, a big boss with a lot of employees. you got to manage stuff. I don't think yeah. it's I don't think it's immoral to consider uh, NBA games with no fans to talk about NBA games. Coaches wear uh, masks. Um, I think this stuff's all on the table. How does it land for you? I mean, Twitter's seeking perfection. That doesn't exist in real life. In real life, you and I have discussions about businesses, and some ideas of ours are probably crazy and some are good. What do you make of the idea of, listen, let's get this NBA season in some way, somehow. It's just going to be a new normal. You know, I, I've been pretty early. Like I, I did a podcast with Gladwell basically right after the Gobert thing happened. Mm -hmm. And I just felt, it just felt like we were just being too optimistic about how all of this is going to play out. And I think we're even feeling it now as people are trying to get excited about sports coming back. And, you know, when we can get through this and these next two months are going to be horrendous, obviously. And once we can get to the other side, when can life start to feel normal again? I just am really skeptical it's going to feel normal for a while. And, you know, you look at, like, the basketball playoffs, I, I think there's a drop-dead date for that. For, like, if it, if it doesn't be able to wrap up by Labor Day, at that point, like, what are we doing? Right. Like, you, you might as well just cancel the season and move on. And so that, so we really have to start by July 1st. So, you know, optimistically, you're going, all right, everything will be normal by July 1st, hopefully, or better, or relatively normal. <laughs> I still think it's going to take a long time for people to want to be in crowds. Yeah. Even if people are telling us it's cool, it's okay. Like just imagine being at the Staples Center or, you know, whatever NBA arena you want to talk about, just sitting in a section with a hundred people. I, I think, I think that's going to take a lot longer to come back than we realize. Yeah. So now we're talking about empty arenas for playoff games and it's like, to what end? Like, I, like, if the players aren't totally comfortable with it, if we haven't figured out a 100% way for everybody to be safe, are we really going to do that? I, I, and I think, you know, now it's April, it's April 1st today. You know, this stuff moves fast. All of a sudden it's going to be May. Are we really going to be at a place where these guys are going to be in empty arenas? I don't see it. I, I think it's going to be more likely it gets canceled. Um, you know, the, the NFL has said, listen, and the NFL is not as tied to social media as the NBA, which has a younger demo. The NFL has said, listen, we're going to do free agency. It's a it's a telephone business. We're going to release the schedule. It's a telephone business. We're going to do the draft. 80, 95 percent of it's a telephone business. I, I argue this. We're not only in a medical crisis. We are soon going to be in a economic crisis. And I also think we're going to have a psychological crisis as unemployment soars. Goldman Sachs predicts 15 percent that I do think the draft is a uniquely positive and hopeful sports event where there are no losers. Even the Buccaneers and the Jags feel great after the weekend. And if you can, right. do, if you can do it by, f I think the stuff matters. I said this to start my show today. Hollywood, people think Hollywood right now is not working. Oh, yes, they are. They, I, it is getting us through the, the talented people, the comedians who are funny on Twitter every day. I'm watching shows and documentaries. I've never felt Hollywood is more vital to my my psychological, you know, sense of well-being. So I, I, I'm for the NFL saying, listen, the draft is optimistic. Nobody loses. It's five days of fun and hope. We're going to go for it. What say you? I heard the beginning of your show. I thought you did a good job with that. You know, 
I know on the face of it, it looks a little dicey, especially like it really does seem like so many things are going to get worse here over the next couple of weeks and whether people are going to be in the yeah. mood to watch college kids get drafted. I don't know. I don't know where we're going to be at the end of April, but hey, I'm with you. I, I feel like if we can do even something as simple as the NFL draft, where it takes people's minds off stuff for the next four to, for four to five days at the end of the month, I don't know why that's a bad thing. And I know the teams are against it. But look, like, you know, I think we've all seen all these things that we thought we were doing a certain way. We've been able to adapt. Like, uh, we're doing it with our business at The Ringer. Like, we figured out how to do probably 70 to 80 percent of our podcasts remotely with people in different yeah. places. Like, you just kind of, we didn't have a choice. But we figured it out. And now we have a model that's been working pretty well. You figured out how to do your show. I, I think... It's okay if they figure out how to do the NFL draft and it's a little different. And these guys don't get, these teams don't get interviews with quarterbacks. Maybe they do it on Zoom. Maybe they do it on FaceTime. Whatever. I, I would, I would really rather see them keep that going because you even look at this week, they announced that, uh, NBA 2K tournament yeah. with the NBA players. People were excited about it. Of course. Oh, so cool. Kevin Durant's going to play a video game against somebody. <laughs> what time? I'm there. Like, nobody has anything to do. Right. So I think the draft will really help in that respect. I hope they keep it. Now, um, I don't know if you heard. You probably did. I broke the Brady story to Tampa Bay. It was, um, you know, again, when the big stuff happens, the herd this is Big J journalism. So, anywho. Uh, I you know, you, you don't get credit when you break stuff. Rosillo and I talk about stuff on our Sunday pod all the time. We really? never get credit. I told people a week and a half ago they were releasing that Jordan documentary early. Nobody listened to me. <laughs> I know you were on the Brady thing. You were on it. You had it. And they, it was 60 to 1 like two months ago. Yeah. The odds were 60 to 1 he was going to go to the box. So somebody actually probably made some money from it. But I would say this. We, um, I look at it, and I'm not into that. Who matters more, Brady or Belichick? I tend to think you, you got to. Th this stuff works because both get along. But I will say this, and and I've thrown this theory out. New England has so much equity. They didn't resign their kicker. They didn't resign their two playmaking linebackers. They're going to go with Jared Stidham. They would have won more games potentially with Teddy Bridgewater. Is that they got 12 picks? I'm going to throw it at you, Bill. They're going to get three compensatory picks next year because of Brady, Van Noy, and Jamie Collins. They're going to move, in my belief, four, five picks this year to next year. They're going to have 14 picks. They're going to be a 7-9 and nine team, 8th in the league draft, ninth. They're going to go to somebody and say, we're going to give you nine picks to get the top pick. Because there's a high probability the worst team in the league next year is not going to need a quarterback. I th It's not tanking. They can still maintain their integrity. Miami this year built a culture losing games. You don't have to win the Super Bowl and win your division to build a culture. I think New England is going to stockpile picks and throw 10 at somebody to get Lawrence or Justin Fields. Rip my theory apart. Yeah, I, I'm not against it. Even the Edelman, it seems like he might be heading to Detroit. Yes. That's official. It's that you know, it's when you talked about. Team, so two things have happened here. They've had a couple bad drafts um, dating back to the two, the, the flake eight losing that first round pick that year. But if you just look at the totality of the drafts from like 15 through last year, not the same. And, you know, they, they kind of ebb and flow with these little runs that the past have, depending on how the drafts were. The second run that they had where they won the three Super Bowls in four years, it was, a lot of that had to do with the, the drafts that they had, the moves they made the years before. Same thing with the first three in 01 and 03 and 04. So I think there's been some at roster atrophy that you could really feel last year. The team was just not that talented last year. They were slow. Year. They were very slow offensively. It just wasn't great. The second half of the season was not good. And, you know, the, the Pats have such – equity with people because over and over again when we think it's over for them they were able to pull it out and last year everybody's waiting but you know the the, the people that were actually watching the team week in and week out were like wow we're this is just not a very good team i think belichick knows that i agree with you i don't think he would ever tank but if you look at the moves they made this year yeah um they're basically they have a huge cap hit like 26 million 
they let go a lot of culture people yep. like Van Noy, Edelman, uh, Brady, huge culture guy. Everybody loved him, awesome teammate. And it does seem like they're going to take their lumps this year. I, here's the thing, though. Colin, Belichick is so much smarter than everybody else. Yes. I, all the advantages they have week to week just from intelligence and IQ and the players they pick. I think it would be impossible for them to go like two and fourteen. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. No, no. They'll win six games because they're smarter. But it is becoming. But could they win ten though? Oh, uh, Bill. And six. Listen, if C.J. Mosley is healthy for the Jets and they patch the old line and they're on their way, their Bills are going to be good. I think Miami's close. Or I think the Jets again. If Mosley's healthy and the old line is better, they're a nine-win team. They won seven last year. The quarterback had mono. With the worst offensive, Did they change their coach. I don't listen. He's not my <laughs> cup of tea, but I. But I'll say this: seven and nine. Last year, the Patriots and Buffalo was good. Seven and nine. Quarterback had mono for a month. It's not a. It's not a shipwreck there. No, I. I like Miami's situation more though with all their picks. Yeah, I think they have a great coach. So I was do so I. impressed with him last year. Yes, hey, really. Like he's top six or top seven. And put a culture in the media. It was basically the opposite of what everyone thought Matt Patricia was going to do. He was a bozo and is a bozo and continues to be a bozo. Brian Flores actually knows what he's doing. Yep. And that Week 17 win that they had when they upset the Patriots completely toppled the playoff picture and was the reason the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. It really was. <laughs> the, the Pats would have been a, had a bye in round one. And that's the, and they just would have pulled it out the way they always do, and everything flipped when they won that game, yep. and that was just because of Flores. Yeah, no, I'm a he, I, we I we've we've said this. We think he's the one guy that works. And by the way, what's the first thing he does second year? He spends money like Belichick does. He goes and gets corners. That's the one position Bills always spent money on is corner. Yep. And Flores is like, yeah, we're gonna have a great secondary. So I, I I'm with you. All right, let's move to something we both have uh, fondness for. Uh, our former employer uh, is coming out with his Bulls doc. Documentary, which you broke the story, didn't get credit, but you will hear because I I believe <laughs> yeah, in journalism. Um, okay, so I said yesterday, and I'm not going to get into my brilliant rant, but I said it's the most beloved team in America, the Bulls, period, end of story, and here's why. They were in the Eastern Conference, but they had a Western Conference glamour. So they had the lunch pail Midwest sensibility. Everybody loved them. They were tough, like Big East basketball and the kind of stuff that New Yorkers are tough. Philadelphia guys tough. They were tough. They were lunch pail. But guys out west, you and I know this. The Pacific Ocean has this ability. It's easier out here. We like finesse. We like glamour. And it matters. Kardashians are celebrities out here. They wouldn't work like that in New York. So he was able to lunch pail it, tough it, and glamorize it. We loved him. Jordan was LeBron still 50 50. I, I contend outside of Detroit and Boston, and even there you respected him. I think it's the most popular team in my life. I don't think you could do a 10 part 30 for 30, which you invented, with any other team. Uh, and so let's start with the premise. I think they're the most popular American sports team, and you can't count Olympic teams. Let's get out of that in my life. Yeah. Do you, do you uh, agree with that? 100%. I think. Uh... There was no experience like that specific Bulls team after Jordan came back for those three years when they came into a city. I've never seen anything like it yeah. before since. I wrote about it. Jordan, I, I look, I get it with the under 30 people. LeBron's their guy. Yeah. They were there for LeBron. They, they, they don't understand why he's not the best. Jordan was just more popular or more famous than LeBron. Yes. Or Kobe or anyone else you want to name. In every conceivable way, he was... He transcended celebrity. He wa I went to games. I remember going to a couple Boston games near his last couple Bulls years here. When he would come in for the you know the pregame warmups, and the whole place would stop, and it was just like eighteen thousand people just staring at one person. There's <laughs> never been another athlete like that. He was so insanely famous and beloved that I'm really glad they're doing this. We tried to do it after we finished the first. Uh, 30 for 30 series where we had everything going in 2009. We knew about this this documentary that NBA Entertainment had had. You know they had filmed his whole season. They had all this behind the scenes stuff. So we got a copy of it and we watched it. And the behind the scenes stuff, it was the real Jordan. It was like the the 
the homicidally competitive Jordan, the guy yelling at his teammates. It was all the stuff that we'd always heard about, but I'd never seen. And we were just like, how do we get this made? Jordan never wanted it. And I think, you know, what happened middle of the decade, especially after LeBron won that Cavs title, when things really started to shift and all of a sudden there was an MJ versus LeBron argument, I think for the first time Jordan and his camp realized Oh, we got to protect our legacy here. Yeah. I think people are starting to forget like how great and famous and how universally everyone thought who was there, this is the best basketball player I'm ever going to see. And I still feel that way. I know you do too. Yeah. No, no. Michael's the best player I've ever seen. LeBron second, Magic's third. I do think Magic was closer to Michael because he elevated teammates, but he wasn't the athlete. He didn't play that. Magic was never a good defender. Um, and right. so those are the three best basketball players I've ever seen. Uh, um, and, I, and I would say this, Muhammad Ali and Michael Jordan are the two most important athletes uh, of my life. Tiger Woods probably has an argument, but it's golf. Um, it's not as personality-driven. Muhammad Ali today, you, you, Muhammad Ali and Michael Jordan were not only great, but they were fashionable. They were good-looking. They were the most glamorous. They were glo- and cool. And they were cool. Like, like yeah. no, nothing against LeBron. I, I never thought LeBron's cool. Michael was cool, right? Well, that, and this was the thing Tiger never had, because I think Tiger would have been the third piece of that. Yeah. And Tiger just wasn't cool like those guys. Jordan was the coolest guy in every room he was in, and yep. that room could have 20 people, 100, or 20,000. And I, I think one of the reasons I'm so excited, and by the way, my friend is doing it, who I did Andre the Giant with, Jason Hare, and he's fantastic. And I'm, re- I'm just really excited for him because I think this doc would have been a big deal anyway. But just the way it's all played out, yeah. where people actually need entertainment, they're moving it up. I think this is going to be one of the biggest docs ever. Oh, I, I think, think it's, it's going to be the biggest it's going to be massive. Stock. Massive. And it's going to remind people, oh, my God, what were we doing? Jordan was the best basketball player ever. Why were we arguing about this? <laughs> this, guy, this guy, he was, I mean, he averaged 41 in the 1993 finals. And it was just like an easy 41. It wasn't, it wasn't like he got hot. This was just, there were more possessions back then. And he was just, I'm getting my 41. I think the, the game six of the 98 finals, which you could pick apart pretty easily from an advanced metric standpoint, he's like 17 for 41 in that game, um, is the greatest game I've ever seen anyone play. And my number two would be game one of LeBron 2018 finals in Golden State. Oh, God, that was, that, that was incredible. That was the second greatest game I've ever seen anybody play. But when you watch what Jordan did in that in that last game, which ended with the famous shot, he, he, Rodman is basically done. He's like luggage at that point. Pippen's got a bad back. He can't move. He's got a bunch of ninth and tenth men around him, and he he has to. He knows he has to win that game. Can't let it get to a game seven, and he knows I have to control every minute of this game. I have to control. Every piece of energy I have in my body, it has to play out a certain way. The pace has to be this, and I have to pick my spots. And it, it's honestly like watching Ali beat Foreman, where Ali's like, okay, this is the only way I can win. I can do, I have to do these 19 things and get it to this point, and then I can, in the 10th round, I can get them. And that's how Jordan handled that game. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life for basketball. It really is. Bill Simmons. Recently sold his uh, project to Spotify, and uh, and by the way, I you know I want to get into your personal life much, but uh, I always said if I uh, you know g- hit it you know big, I would uh, buy a lifetime supply of peanut brittle, and I'd buy a lady in the house that just made all my meals. So I know you're not a <laughs> just it just, didn't have to be a lady by the way, it could be anybody. Just I want somebody making me smoothies for breakfast and salmon salad for lunch. <laughs> So what is the one thing? You're not a showy guy at all. I, I, I don't know you that well, but I know you well enough. You're not showy at all. But is there one thing that you thought about buying? No. No, I, I'm, just, I'm just moving forward. I, I think the exciting thing for us is, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into yeah. the little company we we're building. Yeah. And then we were able to hook up with this bigger company. Yeah. That I've been in that situation before at ESPN, as have you. When you have a huge company that has a big platform and reach and smarts and money, that's honestly the best place to be. That The happiest I've ever been professionally in my whole life was 
you know, the heyday of ESPN when we were doing 30 for 30 in Grantland and, and yeah. you know, ESPN was really spending money on the right things. There wasn't a lot of corporate interference. Good people in charge. I loved it. I really had yeah. – I look back at that. I'm like, that was amazing. I was I was basically on the 27 Yankees for sports media there for four years. So well, you're, I think well, now you're back. So now you're back Spotify and happy. Thing, yeah. I think Spotify has a chance to be that for audio. So that, that was the biggest reason for me. Hey, thanks for um, thanks for coming on the show. You're very, very uh, in demand. It was very kind of you to give. Uh... Wait, you didn't ask me about Brady. I don't understand. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll give you one. Okay, yeah, I have. Give me one minute on Brady. Okay, so well, I ask you about that. So what? What do you specifically do you want? Okay, how is he going to do in Tampa? He's going to be a wild card guy. He's going to be productive, right? Here's my thing. And I can't remember which comedian had this bit, so I apologize. But this is going to be in your wheelhouse, Colin. If, you know, you, like, I don't know if your parents are still alive, but if you have, like, 75-year-old parents yeah. and they've been married for 60 years, 50 years, whatever, yeah. let's say your parents are 78. They've been married for 55 years. And they call you one day and they say, we're getting a divorce. We just, we just kind of had it with each other. We're just, that's it. And your reaction would be like, why now? You guys are in your late 70s. What are you, like, <laughs> this is, what are, what are you going to date? You're going to go on Tinder? Like, you're kind of, you've come this far. Why not just hit the finish line together? And that's how I'm, I really, I feel that way about Brady. I'm like, why now? It's been 20 years. You have a chance to have one of the all-time iconic drafted by a team, finish your career with a team thing. Didn't you watch the reaction with Kobe in Los Angeles, how, how much he meant to people here because he stayed here the whole time and he settled here and the, all the connections he had. Like, what is better than that for a legacy? No, I... You're going to go to Tampa? You're going you're gonna to play for Bruce Arians? You're going to play have a bunch of 75-year-olds in the stands and a team with no history? Like, how, how do you do this? How is this how your career ends? I just don't get it. No, I, I'm the, confused. Yeah, no, the, the parent thing is right. Like, if you get, if you get through 50 years living together in Brooklyn, and you're annoying each other, just tough it out. I mean, just deal with it, just, right? Just na name me one great athlete who really looks back like, oh, man, like MJ, like, oh, man, those last two years on the Wizards. Thank God I did that. <laughs> you know, it's like it, like Favre, like, oh, man, that last Vikings year after we almost made the <laughs> NFC title game when I got the crap kicked out of me and we went like 5-11. and 11. That was awesome. I'm so glad that happened. Like, it just always ends badly, and I, I think he's just going to keep going until this ends badly, until he has the same season that Peyton Manning had, when Peyton Manning had nine TDs and 17 interceptions. And, brought, and people were wondering if Brock Osweiler should take his job. Like, is that how Brady wants this to end? I guess it is. That's a great perspective. You stole it Thanks. from some comedian you forgot, but nonetheless, it was a hell of a perspective. I know. I'm sorry. I apologize to random comedian. I really, <laughs> I know I heard that bit before. It was a great <laughs> bit, and that's how I feel about Brady. It's like, you guys are 78. Why are you getting divorced? That's great. Uh, Bill, I love you. Great. I'm, uh, I'm ready anytime now that you accept phone calls. Just tell me when you want me on. I'm on. All right, buddy. Thanks, man. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.